opportunity to introduce Dr. Tom Power. It's always wonderful to be able to bring someone uh, to the lecture series who's had a close association with the Wilderness Institute for a number of years. We never overlap in um, our actual faculty assignments with the Wilderness and Civilization program, but Dr. Power did actually teach in the Wilderness and Civilization program. There, there was at one time an economics class so I'm looking very closely at the of students in the room. <laughs> um, so uh, he, he's known the Institute and, and specifically the Wilderness and Civilization program for a long time. He's actually been associated with the economics department here at the University of Montana since 1968. He served as the chair of the department from 78 until 2008. In 2008, he retired from teaching in university administration but he continues to remain active as a research professor. He also runs his own consulting firm working on a number of environmental economics projects and the name of his consulting firm is Power Consulting. Uh, his teaching, research, and publications have focused on natural resource economics and the intersection between natural resources and regional economic vitality and well-being. Um, for folks that may have looked him up ahead of time, he has a number of op-eds and available publications online um, that have focused on these topics. Natural resource economics, as he writes, has broadened its focus to include not only the commercial, commercially valuable resources that can be obtained from our natural landscapes, but also the value of non-commercial environmental services that flow from those landscapes and support environmental stability and a high quality of life. And I took his words from um, his biography because I feel like that's what we've uh, showcased through several of our lectures in the course of this se uh, semester. However, we've also heard some differing opinions on how resources should be valued, but we focus largely on those non-market values in the course of this seminar. Um, as a result of this broadening focus of environmental analysis, of, of an, um, environmental economic analysis, environmental and economic issues have become intertwined. Again, as we've seen over and over again over the course of the last several weeks, we continue to see words like wilderness and economics in the same sentence. And um, hopefully it's, it's helped us think about these different ways in which we value ecosystems, wilderness areas, public lands, and all of the intrinsic values associated with those. Um, so Dr. Power is going to wrap the seminar up for us and, and tie together um, some of the themes that we've heard about over the course of the semester so far. Uh, on a personal note, I'm incredibly thankful to both him and Dr. Dahlenberg, who's in the audience, for providing me the names of folks that came to speak in this year's lecture series. As I 
um, said to you in transparency at the beginning of the semester, this was a hard topic for me to choose as a lecture series topic simply because I didn't know anyone in the economics realm. And so um, Dr. Power is one of the folks really responsible for, for bringing the breadth of experience we've been able to bring to the lecture series. So I'm, I'm very honored and pleased that he's here and willing to wrap up our lecture series. And with that, I would like to welcome him. Let's see if this works. I guess it does. Uh, thank you for uh, turning out. I uh, hope you didn't eat or drink too much. Uh, I remember when I was a freshman in college, I was a physics major, and my, uh, the chairman of the physics department uh, taught uh, one of the courses I had to take. And it taught it at uh, 1 o'clock in the afternoon, just after I had stuffed myself with lunch. And I just remember spending class after class doing isometrics to try and stay awake, you know, pinching myself black and blue. Uh, and I'm going to talk a lot of, of economics. Uh, and I don't, I don't really apologize for that uh, since I'm, I'm an economist. Uh, uh, but I hope you uh, uh, can hang with me. Uh, and. Uh, to the end and, and make some uh, sense out of uh, uh, what I want to try to convey. Uh, you've already sat through uh, a whole series, seven uh, uh, lectures so far. Uh, three of them were focused on what I'm really going to try and uh, focus on, and that's the economic valuation of ecosystem services, environmental services, in any case, the extension of economic analysis into areas that uh, typically don't involve commercially traded goods, uh, don't involve commercial businesses, don't involve markets, and what it is that economics uh, can bring uh, to that study uh, in terms of trying to put a dollar value uh, as objectionable as that sounds to a lot of environmentalists, uh, put a dollar value on those environmental services. Uh, you also got uh, two perspectives on a different type of uh, uh, environmental economics or natural resource economics that uh, primarily focus not on uh, the values associated with particular environmental attributes or services, but focused on uh, what's come to be labeled economic impacts. Uh, and I'll have more to say about that uh, uh, as, I, as I proceed here. Uh, that's a different approach because it's taking a look at what the likely impact of development of natural resources is not on the value of what's pulled out of the earth or the cattle that are grazed uh, or the, the recreational activity that may take place, but focused instead on jobs, incomes, tax payments, et cetera. Uh, and you've, you've heard, had two, uh, I think, different uh, uh, versions of how uh, protecting natural areas may uh, have positive impacts on local economic vitality. Uh, you also, thanks to my recommendations, got uh, to hear from two what I affectionately called, call free marketeers. Uh, it's different than mouseketeers, just straightforward free marketeers. Uh, uh, two uh, economists uh, who are skeptical about the way in which we've gone about trying to protect natural areas uh, and wilderness, wildlands in this country namely through the uh, uh, federal government or state governments or local governments uh, actually imposing protections and then on the, those landscapes and then trying to manage uh, those landscapes to protect the natural values associated with them. And uh, Terry Anderson and John Bodden uh, think that the governments have done quite lousy job uh, that command and control via the government is not a bright idea and that real environmentalists ought to be 
uh, interested or looking at more decentralized, non-governmental, even market-related ways of protecting uh, uh, environmental uh, uh, services. Uh, through all that, I suspect most of you uh, still have some real doubts about what, whether economics belongs in the business of trying to deal with uh, things like uh, wildland preservation, uh, 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 wildlife, uh, scenic beauty, a whole broad range of environmental goods and services that typically aren't provided via commercial businesses but are provided simply by the natural environment itself or landscapes that end up being protected so that they can co continue to provide those, uh, those uh, environmental services. Uh, for a long time, economists have been accused of being people who know the price of everything but the value of nothing. Uh, that's partly tied to economists' close association with, uh, with business and uh, commercial markets. Uh, going back to Adam Smith, uh, he sort of sneered about the mentality of small British shopkeepers, uh, Napoleon, and I think that's apocryphal in trying to put the British down, claimed that it was a nation of shopkeepers, uh, sneering uh, that French had culture and the English had shopkeepers. Uh, but uh, I think it's not entirely unfair to argue that uh, the economics as a social science is just uh, uh, a propaganda uh, uh, effort uh, to promote the mentality of small business uh, shopkeepers, uh, small English shopkeepers, as a way of life uh, and a way of uh, uh, looking at, at the world. And finally, poets, <laughs> again, two centuries ago, along with Adam Smith, uh, were suspicious of those British shopkeepers. And I have a quote from Wordsworth here about high heavens rejecting the lore of nicely calculated less or more. Uh, again, a British shopkeeper mentality. So who in the world would want to invite economists uh, into what has thus far been protected or shielded uh, from uh, market economics, uh, from commercial business exchanges? Uh, uh, who would want to invite uh, economics in to try to deal with something uh, like the beauty of a raptor soaring overhead uh, or the beauty of the, the uh, Mission Mountains as you come over uh, uh, the hill and, and see the Mission Mountains and the Mission Valley spread out there. Uh, uh, who would want to get, invite an economist or economic valuation uh, uh, into that? Uh, I'm going to be what Harry T President Truman uh, said he hated the most about economists and that that's that they had two arms. He wanted a one-armed economist so they wouldn't be saying on the one hand this is what could happen but on the other the opposite might happen. Uh, he wanted to take one of those arms away so that he could hear a clear message. I'm going to try to uh, provide a defense of uh, uh, extending economic valuation uh, into dealing with things like wildland preservation, other environmental issues, uh, because I think economists, either by accident or on purpose, uh, have defined what they mean when they're talking about economic values in a way that avoids many of the philosophic, cultural, or ethical concerns that a lot of people have uh, about uh, making use of, of uh, economic analysis when you're dealing something that you feel is very, very precious to you. Uh, but in the end, uh, I'll remind you that despite my enthusiastic endorsement, or at least lukewarm endorsement, uh, there remain some, some uh, serious potential dangers associated with uh, inviting uh, economists in to help work on 
uh, protecting uh, environmental services, uh, protecting wildlands, uh, uh, et cetera. Uh, I guess one could ask at the beginning, why, why go there at all? Why, why get economics involved? Almost most people understand what it is there, that, that uh, we're trying to protect with wilderness uh, or wilderness with small w wildlands. Uh, most people understand uh, 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 the beauty, uh, the repose, the uh, peacefulness, uh, uh, the spirituality that's associated with, with uh, uh, engaging uh, 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 natural landscapes uh, uh, regularly within their lives. Uh, and the answer to that is fairly straightforward. Uh, uh, number one, economics uh, is not about commercial business. Uh, it's not an accident that the business schools in this building and across the way in the College of Humanities and Sciences is where the economics department is located. Economists don't think uh, that what they're dealing with is primarily commercial businesses or primarily markets. In fact, uh, if markets worked perfectly uh, and commercial businesses were always guided to optimal use of resources, one wouldn't need economics. Uh, economics is there either to make the case about how wonderful markets are, and they spent an unfortunate amount of time uh, being naive in that regard, or by pointing out where markets fail and what we can do about it uh, if they fail. Uh, so economics is not about commercial business. Uh, it's, it's, as uh, some economists have said, it's simply the study of human choice in the face of scarcity. And we face that whether we have a market economy or not, uh, whether we're operating uh, within the family or the household, uh, whether we're an indigenous population that has never heard or dealt with a commercial business, uh, et cetera. Uh, one type of economic value automatically, namely market values, market prices, automatically uh, reflect to us uh, with greater or lesser accuracy uh, the economic value of resources, goods, services. Uh, so that type of economic value is always present when one's dealing with something that has commercial value. Uh, the problem with it is that it deals with only one part of economic value, a subset of economic value, and other types of economic value get ignored. Uh, that amounts to saying that some economic values get dramatically present, presented to people in ways they can't refuse because they, that information comes to them in the form of a price or a cost. And others implicitly have a zero value. Other important economic values implicitly end up having a zero value uh, assigned to them. Uh, that obviously uh, uh, is a serious error. Zero is a very exact quantitative value, quite small, uh, uh, but it, it involves placing an incorrect value, zero, uh, on important economic values, uh, and as a result, uh, decisions making based on that uh, incomplete presentation of economic values is biased and resources are going to end up being used badly. Okay, I want to uh, narrow down uh, what, what I'm going to talk about. Uh, I'm not, I don't want to talk about uh, local economic impacts. That's where most people, that's most of the economics people have learned from their grandparents, parents, school teachers who hated economics like they hated mathematics. Uh, and taught you to hate it too. Uh, the, that's what you find on the business page of the Missoulian or any other newspaper. Uh, it's, it analyzes 
uh, the economy in terms of business decisions or government decisions and whether they create more jobs, more payroll, more tax revenues or not. Uh, that's the, sort of the Chamber of Commerce view of things uh, without uh, uh, trying to be derogatory at all. I've labeled it folk economics and use popular economics if you want. Uh, but I'm not going to be talking about that. I'm going to be focused on economic value uh, with a very straightforward, if, if, even though it'll sound grossly uh, overgeneral, uh, where at least from my point of view, we're talking about the capacity of a good service or resource to make a positive impact in people's lives. Uh, scarcity is going to be involved. We'll walk through some of that uh, in a minute. But I'm going to be focusing on what it is that our decisions about the use of scarce resources, what are the positive things it provides us with, or what are the things that get destroyed that would have been positive. Uh, so looking at the benefits and costs associated with those decisions. The problem with the economic impacts approach, and you see it all the time, uh, when the EPA came, first came out with their clean power plan uh, and uh, in the final rule uh, indicated that Montana would have to reduce their, the carbon emissions from uh, uh, fossil fueled uh, electric generators, primarily coal fired generators at coal strip uh, by 42% uh, or 47%, depending on uh, how, how it was measured. Uh, Northwest Energy, one of the uh, owners of Coal Strip, uh, immediately hired some economists who happened to have offices up, upstairs here uh, to calculate what the local economic impacts were going to be. And they calculated it was going to be devastating. It was going to be worse than the, than the Great Recession. Uh, uh, on the overall economy, it was going to linger for decades into the future. Uh, I'm not aiming at criticizing that right now. Uh, what I just want to mention uh, is that one of the reasons most economists aren't very impressed by that sort of analysis and don't think of it, I think of it more as public relations than as economics, uh, because what it, the University of Montana uh, every several years hires economists to say, how important the University of Montana is in the Western Montana economy. Uh, the Montana Arts Council hires economists every five years to say how important poetry is from an economic point of view, or, or uh, ceramics, or anyways, art in general. Uh, I'm just waiting for you know, a coalition of Christian churches to hire them to estimate the economic impact of Holy Communion. Uh, or something like that. I mean, they're just, uh, it's just people out trying to uh, show how much more important they are uh, by stating what good they do, what value they create, not in terms of what they actually create, but in terms of the number of jobs, the size of the payroll, the taxes paid. Uh, from an economic point of view, that suggests we should be out trying to maximize jobs, maximize payroll, maximize taxes. Any business that tries to maximize their payroll is not going to be in business very long. Uh, uh, any economic development effort that tries to maximize jobs, I just think of pictures uh, in East Africa where people are carrying uh, ore from a mine, an open pit mine, and in wicker baskets on their heads and sandals going up circular paths. And I, I think if, if that's how the Berkeley pit had been built, think of the millions of people that could have been employed uh, carrying out one basket at a time. Uh, uh, yet what was allowed instead to go forward was one technological change after another that allowed that mine to continue to operate despite the ongoing decline in the quality of the ore incredible amounts of technological innovation that cut jobs, may or may not have cut payroll because those wages continued to increase. But in any case, that economic impact approach confuses benefits and costs. The jobs are, represent scarce workers, skilled and unskilled workers who are being used to do one thing rather than another. They can't do both. Uh, that payroll is the cost 
of using those workers in this activity rather than another. The taxes, uh, most businesses don't look forward to paying their taxes. They don't think of that, the taxes they pay as a social benefit. Uh, in any case, I'm going to focus on economic values, uh, not uh, on uh, local economic impact analysis. So how we're going to go about measuring that capacity to make a positive difference, uh, what I've offered as a tentative, very general definition of, of economic value. I'm going to narrow down in a minute. Uh, well, if you already have something that's valuable, then the measure, at least conceptually, is what compensation you'll demand before you voluntarily give it up, your willingness to accept compensation for something you have. So which you use, whether it's willingness to pay, that's if, if you don't have it but you want it, what are you willing to pay to get it? Which one's appropriate uh, probably depends on property rights. Uh, they don't lead to the same quantitative answers, so they, it makes a difference. Uh, how do we get that information? Well, economists like to watch how people behave. Uh, watch the distance people will travel to get to certain parks or to wilderness areas. Watch the time they sacrifice. Uh, uh, that's the entry fee, if you want, in order to get those high quality natural, natural environments. Or they study uh, uh, homeowner decisions in Los Angeles uh, where depending on how, because of the prevailing wind, some areas are much more heavily polluted than others. The less polluted areas, the same sort of house, the same sort of law uh, uh, is going to cost a hell of a lot more than in the heavily polluted areas. So often for these non-market values, you have to engage in market activity uh, in order to get access, what you, access to what you want. That could be less noise from an airport. That could be crime rates, uh, et cetera. Uh, so often, uh, we can study people's behavior and see what sacrifices they, in fact, are making uh, to uh, uh, indicate to us that, that willingness to pay. Where that won't work, because the value uh, that we're talking about doesn't require uh, uh, geographic presence in the same vicinity of, of what's important to you or what it is that you value. Uh, if what we're talking about are not use values, uh, then we have to turn to carefully, craftily designed uh, surveys uh, to try and ask people uh, 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 about this willingness to pay or willingness to accept compensation. Uh, one of the most difficult things for non-economists and for some of us economists uh, is whether one can deal with some things that are very important to people, uh, that matter a lot to people, uh, and can use economic tools without uh, running into uh, serious ethical or cultural problems. Uh, as I said before, I think economists have tried to dodge that, and so I can just jump ahead and, and, and talk about what economic values are not. Uh, that's, this is supposed to give you some, uh, some confidence uh, that you may not be dropping over the deep end if you're interested in protecting wildlands, uh, if you're uh, uh, interested in endangered species, uh, et cetera. Uh, that uh, making use of economic arguments or economic valuation uh, doesn't involve uh, abandoning uh, the values you actually hold. Uh, I'm going to walk through each of these, so uh, uh, I'm not going to read them all right now. <laughs> I'll, just start, I'll just start marching through them uh, one at a time here. Uh, quantifying non-market economic values and I, I hope by now you've gathered that, it, that at least economists uh, think that it's not an, either an oxymoron or a contradiction to say non-market economic value or non-commercial economic value. Uh, we have values. There's things we prefer. There's things we value outside of the realm of commerce. 
uh, and if they involve uh, 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 scarce resources and some other characteristics, uh, economics may well be able to help a lot. In any case, the point of quantifying non-market economic values is not so that we can move them into the commercial economy. It's not so we can marketize them. Uh, that's not the objective. Uh, it's so that we can compare commercial values, for instance, the value of gold and silver in the wetlands above uh, Bristol Bay in Alaska, which I think John Duffield may have talked about. Uh, uh, it allow, allows us to respond to the assertions by the people who want to put uh, one of the world's largest open pit mines into those wetlands. Uh, uh, allows us to talk uh, uh, directly or compare directly what they say uh, is going to be the benefit of the mine, uh, the copper and the gold, and uh, can try and contrast that with the uses, the values that are uh, being currently uh, supported uh, by those natural wetlands, uh, the habitat they provide for, for salmon fishery as well as other wildlife. Uh, some economists, Terry Anderson certainly, John Bodden, do want to commercialize, uh, well, let me back up, let me start with a less loaded word, do want to consider non-governmental solutions to environmental problems. That could be NGOs managing uh, uh, wilderness areas or managing national parks. Uh, they want to see more market mimicking type things uh, to get people to treat uh, natural areas with more respect, including charging them entry fees, uh, asking people who value natural landscapes to, to uh, help pay for the management and maintenance of those areas. Uh, but that is not what the economic project is all about. That's a particular uh, political point of view uh, that thinks that we've simply depended uh, unwisely uh, too much on government. Uh, but that's not uh, what economists are working on when they talk about uh, uh, estimating the economic values associated with environmental services. Uh, economic values also are not just self-interested values. I mean, obviously, uh, people value things other than themselves. We aren't, I mean, we all do like to hug ourselves and get other people to hug us. Uh, uh, but we, we value a much broader range of things than just ourselves. Uh, uh, and that from an economist's point of view, it's what value, whatever it is we value, uh, with some provisos I'm going to provide in a minute, uh, economics is to take that seriously, whatever it is that we value, uh, and, and see if, if uh, uh, the way that interacts with non-market goods, services, resources, uh, can be expressed in economic terms. It is humans that do the valuing. Uh, but it's not only humans who are being valued. Uh, people are broader than that. Their values are broader than that. Uh, and so uh, one really doesn't have to, uh, I, I don't think, uh, uh, worry about that side of things. Uh, I've al already mentioned use values. Uh, use values involve take, take parks, national parks, and wilderness areas. If the only economic values were use values, our parks and our wilderness areas might well be in big trouble. It means that the values can only be realized if people are present on those landscapes enjoying them. We can end up loving our parks and our wilderness areas to death by flooding them uh, with visitors uh, who may not know how to take, take care of it. Uh, but economists have recognized almost from the beginning uh, when they started talking about uh, non-market 
uh, economic values, that there's some non-use values. Uh, the easiest one, I think, for most people to grasp is what has come to be labeled existence values. Just knowing that something like the Grand Canyon has not been dammed, or as it currently is, is not going to be continued to be scoured by cold, clear water so that the, the uh, uh, river floats that used to allow people access uh, to the spectacular canyon, uh, that that river bottom is, isn't uh, systematically uh, uh, destroyed uh, as a result of the large dams up, upstream. Uh, but in any case, uh, people can take value in knowing something that they appreciate has been saved or isn't being degraded. Uh, the best example, the most poignant example for me uh, is that I would love to see the grizzly bears file, you know, wander back into the Selway Bitterroot Wilderness where I've spent a lot of time uh, camping, backpacking, etc. But if they do come back, it will not make my experience in the Selway Bitterroot Wilderness better. I will be scared shitless, <laughs> especially if I have my kids. And that goes back to when my, my son was three years old. We were up in the Canadian Rockies camping out. And I was down uh, on this roaring river. And we were throwing rocks in. And I happened to look over my shoulder. And 100 feet away was a big grizzly bear just slowly walking by. I said, what the fuck? What do I do? <laughs> Jump? Am I going to jump into this river, this cold uh, rapids, and hope I can keep my son's head above the water until my skull gets cracked? Or do we get eaten? In any case, uh, I appreciate, I value grizzly bears being there. But I don't want to use the grizzly bears. <laughs> I don't want to see them close up. I don't want to sniff them. I don't want them to sniff me. Uh, I can take value in grizzly bears, the existence value of grizzly bears, uh, without uh, that being a use value. That's an existence value. But it can be option values, keeping options open for the future. You don't know what the future is going to be like. Why make an irreversible change, uh, such as extinction or the development of a wild area uh, that can't be undone? Uh, the idea of passing things on to future generations, not necessarily your own kids, but to just uh, uh, future generations. So economic values are not just use values. This one may sound more obscure. And that's that economic values are incremental values, not total values. Uh, most economists spend absolutely no time figuring out what all the gold in the world is worth. If you knew, what would you do about it? Um, but economists do worry about what the price of gold is. But the price of gold has nothing to do with the value of all the gold in the world. It has to do with, given what the supply is now and what the demand is not, now, if you want to buy a small quantity, what will you have to pay? If you have a quantity, small quantity to sell, what will you get for it? That's what the price of gold is. It's an incremental value for a small purchase or small sale. That's, that's the economic value now. Uh, uh, that gets carried over when talking uh, about the economic values associated uh, with non-marketed environmental goods and services, too. Uh, we aren't going to talk about the value of all grizzly bears or all uh, golden eagles. Uh, uh, we're going to be talking about small changes uh, in the uh, uh, supply or demand uh, and the economic value associated. Once one moves beyond that incremental level, uh, you're going to change the price. You're going to change the value. Uh, trying to estimate what all the gold in the world is worth uh, means you're going to have to know what the last ounce of gold. What would somebody pay for the last ounce of gold? Where are you going to get information like that? You'd have to know what everybody's demand for gold, what the shape of their demand curve is. Uh, and even in ranges where 
uh, they haven't even considered uh, 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 buying or selling gold. Uh, so we aren't talking about uh, all or nothing type values. That economics isn't going to be able to help you with that. It doesn't, that's not what market prices are, that's not what economic values are uh, in a commercial setting. Economic values are relative values. They are not intrinsic values. Economists don't know anything about intrinsic problems. Economists are the engineers of the social sciences. They don't read poetry. Never mind. <laughs> uh, the, uh, economic values are uh, stated in barter terms. Uh, what of something that you have that's valuable to you are you willing to give up in order to get something that you want more of? One can state economic values entirely in barter terms. Now, we usually state them in dollar, do, in dollar terms, but that's just because it's more convenient than stating things in barter terms. But the value, the economic value of something is stated in terms of uh, quantities of something else. So we aren't asking uh, what a mountain peak or a soaring raptor or a wild river is really worth in a philosophic or cultural or spiritual or poetic sense. That's not to put down any of those different ways that we could value, uh, play, talk about the intrinsic value of certain things. It's just that economists aren't messing with that. It's not that they don't care about it. Economics doesn't try to deal with it. Uh, so one doesn't have to worry about, uh, or one shouldn't be worried about, economists uh, stepping on or stepping over some sort of line uh, that, that uh, confuses cultural, spiritual, or poetic uh, uh, values, intrinsic values. Now, here comes the limits on economic valuation. Uh, barter, stating some values in barter terms, uh, clearly involves a trade-off analysis. Uh, it, it accepts that it's reasonable to sacrifice a certain quantity of one thing to get a certain quantity of another thing that you can put them on the same scale if you want, that you can trade them off uh, in your own mind as you try to make a decision of what it is you want to do, what decision you want to make. Uh, but trade-off analysis is not always uh, uh, ethically or culturally uh, appropriate. Uh, over the last couple of years, uh, I've been working on the uh, uh, Canadian equivalent of the Endangered Species Act uh, in Canada and working with, with uh, uh, lots of First Nations and uh, other Aboriginal uh, people. Uh, and they simply categorically reject any uh, assignment of a dollar value uh, to their lands, uh, to the subsistence activities they engage in, even when that uh, represents most of their uh, food intake. Uh, uh, they don't want the time that they spend engaged in uh, traditional subsistence and cultural activities uh, to be valued at the wage they're giving up because they don't go into the market economy. Uh, they just don't think that, that trade-offs of their way of that that one can talk and trade off terms with their way of life, uh, uh, their cultural activities, uh, their spirituality, uh, uh, that it's just uh, inappropriate. Uh, the caribou they hunt or the salmon they catch is not the equivalent of canned dog food or canned salmon that you can get from Costco uh, at some, in some Alaskan city. That to them is just a gross affront to even suggest that that sort of trade-off analysis will tell you anything important about the values at stake. 
Uh, I think a lot of people who have uh, really doubtful feelings about the application of economics in environmental settings uh, have the same doubts. Uh, any case, where, what's the legitimate realm for economic valuation? Uh, some of these are not controversial. I'm headed just back down to the trade-off analysis. Uh, economics deals with problems, decisions, choices, where there's a scarce resource at issue. If there's not a scarce resource, what do you have to decide? Just how much you want to use. Uh, uh, the scarce resources have more than one use. If they only have one use, there's not a hell of a lot of decisions to make either. Uh, those uses are valued by more than one person. Economists uh, like to think of economics as a social science where the biggest thing they have to wrestle with is that people have different values and different preferences. How do you take millions of people with different values and different preferences and try and distill out of that some statement of value. That's the challenge economics has always faced, uh, and that's why uh, it's, it's a problem in applied mathematics if there's only one person. You're just optimizing or minimizing, uh, maximizing or minimizing, optimizing. Uh, uh, the final thing that I wanted to emphasize is that Trade-off analysis has to be ethically or culturally appropriate in the setting where you're thinking about engaging in economic valuation. If it's not, it's probably true that uh, economic valuation uh, is inappropriate too and is not going to be useful, uh, is just going to be confusing. So the, that idea or the sort of the key stumbling block or the key limit, uh, from my point of view, in terms of where economists can go in terms of uh, analyzing the economic value of environmental goods and services, wild lands, uh, 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 high quality natural uh, landscapes, et cetera, is, is the problem you're looking at, dealing with, uh, is it one where uh, we can engage in that sort of trade-off analysis? Whoops, what did he do? Uh, now, economists have found some ways of, of uh, uh, getting around some of these limitations about trade-off analysis being inappropriate or only looking at incremental change. Dying is not an incremental change. Well, I, it depends on your religious beliefs, I guess. Uh, 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 but life and death is not an incremental, it's not just a slight quantitative change or uh, uh, incremental change. Serious disability isn't either. Species going extinct is not an incremental change. Uh, uh, it's yeah, irreversible changes uh, that wipe out things of value are not incremental changes. Uh, uh, probably for that same reason, trade-off analysis uh, also may be uh, judged to be inappropriate. That's certainly too true if most most life and death uh, uh, situations. You don't try to calculate based on the productivity of the person who's uh, uh, threatened with death. Are they worth saving? Uh, uh, well, what's their paycheck look like? You know, how many patents do they have? Uh, uh, most people would find that sort of trade-off analysis or that sort of importation of, of uh, economic valuation uh, disturbing uh, if not just uh, grossly inappropriate. Uh, but economists, there, quit doing that. Uh, uh, but economists have found some uh, easy ways around some of these uh, problems. Uh, and I'm just going to provide one here. How, how can you shift life, life and death events into sort of a work a day incremental uh, uh, approach? Uh, and uh, the answer to that is you can't if you're talking about the life or death of a particular person. Uh, if, on the other hand, uh, you're talking about uh, reducing the probability of someone dying, uh, especially if the probability is quite low to begin with, in the example I have here, if in some particular activity, some type of job, uh, there's one, uh, there's a two in a million 
uh, likelihood that uh, somebody's going to die or be seriously injured. And you can change that. You can reduce that risk to one in a million. Uh, and that, uh, what that would cost is about $5 per person at risk. Uh, should you be thinking in those terms? And I think most economists' answers would be, answer would be, yes, we do it every day. Every day of our life when we decide whether we're going to drive faster than the speed limit or whether we're going to drive to Butte uh, uh, on St. Patrick's Day uh, uh, and drive back despite the fact there's a blizzard outside uh, at the time. Uh, every time we go backcountry skiing or kayaking uh, uh, in a uh, uh, appropriately wild river, we make decisions about what risk we're willing to take on, what risk we're willing to take on for our family, etc. Uh, so if we can reduce the question uh, to uh, small changes uh, in the likelihood of an unlikely event, uh, we know that, at least most of us know, that we aren't crossing some ethical uh, uh, guideline uh, that that uh, 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 the, the ethical problems come with talking about a particular person's life, uh, uh, not uh, changing uh, likelihoods of unknown people uh, 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 facing desperate situations. Uh, and the same can be said about uh, habitat for endangered species. One can reduce that most. We're usually not talking about some all or nothing type thing where all uh, grizzly bear habitat disappears or all wolf habitat disappears. Uh, we're ta usually talking about decisions that increase somewhat the likelihood of the uh, particular uh, endangered species uh, not being wiped out. In that sort of setting, again, we may well not cross uh, 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 a cultural or or uh, ethical line in applying economic valuation. Uh, so what's not to like about non-market economic valuation? Uh, I'm going to talk about these individually. I'm going to do it fast. Uh, the, all societies have tried to put some limits, uh, try to restrict the realm in which market activity and market valuation takes place. And even though economists aren't talking about extending markets or commercial business into these realms when they engage in non-market valuation, they are extending uh, a market mentality, a trade-off analysis, et cetera. Uh, most of the things that are most important to us, we shield from the market through uh, families, through personal relationships, uh, uh, through uh, government decision making or protection, uh, through religion, etc. Uh, so we know there's a limit uh, to where we want not only markets but the market mentality uh, 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 to be dominating our lives. Uh, that sort of uh, uh, careful calculation of less or more applied within the realm of personal relationships uh, social relationships, community, uh, certainly can have uh, a, a corrosive impact. Uh, secondly, don't trust economists, especially if they're talking about long-term things like climate change or the extinction of species. Uh, uh, economists systematically, almost all economists, systematically discount the future. And if you don't know what a discount rate is, I have an example there. Uh, if, even if you're just discounting the future at a 3% annual rate, a dollar, 100 years from now, today, the present value, uh, is only 5 cents. 95% uh, of the value is, is dismissed uh, because it's so far off in the future. If instead you use 7%, 99.9% uh, of the value would be dismissed and only a tenth of a cent of that future dollar uh, would show up in the economist's calculation. Economists are also technological optimists. Uh, they, they believe, firmly believe, uh, that technologies we don't know anything about, business organizations we don't know anything about at the current time, 
will create substitutes so we don't have to worry about the depletion of natural resources. Uh, we'll keep scarcity at bay, environmental degradation at bay, and definitely into the future. Uh, that's not uh, uh, based on uh, just on ignorance. That's, in fact, based on their knowledge of the tremendous changes that have taken place over time that have allowed us to stretch resources further and further and further. Uh, uh, it is based on faith, tied to a couple hundred years of technological development, uh, but it is still tied to faith. Uh, uh, finally, economics uh, by design is proudly amoral uh, and unguided. Uh, somebody once said the basic theorem of economics is that everyone has their price. Uh, that wasn't Donald Trump, Trump who said that. Uh, but just keep offering more money until you find their price. And they will abandon all ethical standards and do whatever you're asking them to do. Uh, there's, no, there's no ethical uh, scheme of things or a code of morality that I know that begins with, if gains exceed losses, do it. You know, if cheating on your partner provides more pleasure than the hassle of being found out, do it. Uh, that, you know, Ten Commandments don't say, thou shalt not kill unless the benefits exceed the cost. <laughs> uh, uh, any case, uh, private pursuit of private gain gets enthroned as a social virtue. The invisible hand is supposed to solve. It's going to take our private pursuit of private gain and turn it into the pursuit of, of social gain. Even no matter what our motivations is, if our motivations are, this is, this is Adam Smith, if they're perfectly selfish and we are intent on screwing somebody, competition will keep us from doing it and we'll make all the energy we put into trying to screw everyone around us, we'll turn it in to a more productive economy so that all of us are better off. The motivation doesn't matter. Even our laws don't accept that principle. Motivation does matter. It's the difference between first degree murder uh, and, and uh, uh, what's the word I want for manslaughter anyways, careless manslaughter. Uh, where you just did something stupid. Uh, uh, so why use non-market valuation? I said that at the beginning. Uh, uh, to document the full range of values that humans have, to document that commercial values are just a subset of what we value, to keep public economic policy from being dominated by commercial interests at the expense of the full range of citizens' interests. Uh, the alternative is to seek the moral high ground, and I urge everyone to do that always, uh, uh, but to do it without uh, engaging in, in uh, moral uh, 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 unilateral disarmament. Uh, uh, the alternative is not to just say it's not by bread alone that we live, that, that, that we're focused on values that are above economic values. Uh, one can do that, uh, uh, but there's tools available, and I think economics uh, provides them, uh, that allow you to stand up in the face of, of commercial demands uh, and show that even uh, on straightforward economic grounds, Many, many of the decisions that degrade our wildlands uh, and our natural environment are uneconomic, that they're gratuitously damaging, uh, and that given that we have tools that I think often can be safely uh, used, it may be worth a tactical bargain with the devil uh, in order uh, not uh, to give up on making the ethical or moral or cultural uh, case, uh, but also to make the economic case. Thank you.
Questions, comments, objections? Everybody wants to get out. No, oh, no, an economist, a ringer. You, I believe you're responsible for suggesting Terry Anderson. I know you worked with Terry, but you have very different views than Dr. Anderson. So how do you, why is it you choose to look at all these different perspectives and bring them in? Well, I've, I've always considered myself uh, a decentralist. Uh, one, I think the first thing I ever got published uh, was something arguing that federal regulation of strip mining uh, on public lands uh, might not be a good idea uh, because I suspected that the federal standards would be worse than the state standards. Uh, so I didn't, I didn't, I didn't want to pass that on. I wanted, I had confidence that Montanans would probably make a better decision uh, than, than the federal government. So, so uh, they invite me because I'm a, <clears throat> a decentralist. Uh, I, th I think that uh, amazing amount of decision making about use of resources and uh, the design of our communities, et cetera, et cetera, is done by NGOs, not for, for profit organizations, uh, uh, that are a powerful political, moral, uh, organizational force, et cetera, et cetera. You know, so let a thousand flowers uh, bloom. Uh, I have more confidence in them than I do in the federal government. Uh, so, um, and, and, and partly it's the, the reason I'm interested in uh, Terry Anderson, he and I wrote a book together, or edited a book, uh, is that I think he's just wrong on certain things. <laughs> uh, no, I, I, I think that I think that people that people are tr part of us are tr is tribal in nature, and we want to hold things in common. We want to share things. Uh, that public parks and public spaces go back to at least the ancient Greeks, uh, and what we call freedom didn't used to be liberty. It used to be people's right to use their, their rights as a citizen to use common resources. That's what their freedom was, was their right to make use of these shared resources because we're all members of the same group. And so I think he's just wrong on the anthropology uh, and psychology of what people want. They don't want, they want to be individuals. I mean, that's the eternal mystery that humanity will spend forever trying to deal with. They want to be respected as individuals, but they also want to be part of a club or a unit or a, a community. Uh, and I think he, he surrenders too much to the uh, small British shopkeeper mentality uh, and trivializes human beings and, and, and what it is they want uh, uh, from their collective decision making. Never. That was that less than five minutes. Yes. Yeah. Do you mind um, summarizing again? No. What you, your point about um, Aboriginal value and how it's kind of um, separate from our system of valuation, just because of that. Well, it's. So, I mean, some people have uh, some non-Aboriginal. We're all Aboriginal somewhere. Uh, have, for instance, t talked about Yosemite Valley or Grand Canyon, uh, that degrading it, you'd be like vandalizing uh, St. Peter's Basilica. Uh, 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 that, that this, or it's like, I mean, Christ did chase the money lenders or the money changers out of the temple. Uh, that, and that I think I think the Aboriginals are simply making that point that that the process of hunting caribou uh, or catching salmon in traditional ways 
is not the same as buying a can of dog food yeah. or a can of, I mean, you know what canned salmon is like. Yeah. Uh, uh, you know, that, I mean, it's just appalling, you know, when they see somebody who thinks they're helping them out. So uh, how, do you, how do you defend that minority um, economically? Oh, no, you, as, as that one slide said, economics is out. You can, if if trade-off analysis in the particular situation you're dealing with uh, is not culturally or ethically appropriate, economics has economics can offer you nothing in the way of economic valuation. Now that's not that economics can offer you nothing. One can change things and stop doing cost-benefit analysis, that's where you're doing the trade-offs, and do cost-effectiveness. You can say if you only have X budget, how can you get to do something? How can you get the most valuable set of things given your values? So the cost is set. You know, now you have to pick in your fr value framework, you have to pick the things that are most important to you. So you don't have to get into the trade-off uh, or the valuation of each, each one because one side of the equation uh, ha has, has been determined. Same with dealing with endangered species. Uh, and for good or for bad, the federal agencies often do this. They just, they just say that given our budget, you know, we can't do anything more, we're going to have to drop something else. Anyways, so they turn to cost effectiveness analysis. So I don't think economics has to be given up on, but economic valuation has to. And let those people speak for themselves, and they can do it in a very, very articulate way. Uh, and and they are, they're going to argue among themselves, because let's take Bristol Bay. The fisheries are primarily peopled. Uh, by, uh, by uh, Aboriginal people. I mean, they, they own the permits, they, uh, they own the boats, uh, et cetera. So their view of Bristol Bay is commercially oriented. They aren't engaged in traditional subsistence activity. They're worried about what the mine will do to the uh, uh, breeding grounds for the salmon and what that will do uh, to the commercial part of the economy that they are closely associated with. Uh, yeah. The Aboriginal uh, folks that you were studying, did they, uh, were they using money for, for anything? Were they trading with, with money at all, or were they completely subsisting slaves? No, no they are uh, significant uh, uh, part of their uh, to, you know, overall economy does involve uh, uh, purchases. <clears throat> they own, you know, uh, they may well own, they're going to own rifles. Sure. Yeah. Uh, uh, other areas, they certainly own snowmobiles. Uh, and so it, it's a much more uh, complicated and fluid uh, cultural setting. Uh, they still it's still important to them that the subsistence activity is not so much uh, economic to them as it is them related to the, relating to the land, them relating to their kids, teaching their kids what they know, passing on uh, traditional knowledge from one generation to another. So that uh, the, set of, the set of values uh, includes social values, uh, it's not just uh, uh, focused on what you're doing to stay alive or what you're doing to feed your family. I just think it's interesting that um, I mean, there's a line drawn somewhere closer to those people of what's on the table and what's off the table, you know, what can be measured by economics and what can't. And certainly they're sacrificing some type of resources, uh, probably some type of natural resources to get that money to buy those guns. And I'm just curious. Uh, it's just interesting to me that how they've navigated that and decided what's 
you know, what's, uh, what can be valued financially and what can't. Well, I don't know if I'm articulating that well. Yeah, no, no I, I, that, we found ourselves, uh, we, we were hired by Environment Canada, uh, but only at the insistence uh, <clears throat> of First Nations groups that under their Endangered Species Act, I'm using the American term, uh, 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 First Nations Aboriginal Council had to be created to make sure that Aboriginal uh, cultural values were and 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 uh, traditional knowledge informed the federal government's decisions about endangered species. Uh, they don't want limits on their hunting caribou or their hunting polar bears. Uh, uh, so uh, we we ended up caught between the limitations they saw on how they wanted to look at protecting endangered species and Environment Canada that was gung-ho on economic valuation. Uh, and uh, it wasn't an altogether pleasant experience because we were being uh, tugged uh, uh, both, both directions. Way in the back there, yeah. Um, I've been a wilderness advocate for several decades. Um, and going back a few decades, it seems like the wilderness community always advocated for wilderness based on those non-use values that you talked about. Um, it seems today that the wilderness community always tries to put economic arguments up first. I look at brochures for wilderness campaigns or websites of wilderness groups, and they always talk about the economic values of wilderness. And it's usually those chamber of commerce type economic values you were talking about. Jobs for the local economy, blah, blah, blah. How do you think that changes the way we perceive wildlands <clears throat> or wilderness when you think about it in terms of that, those economic values? Well, I, I'm, I have always been worried, even though I've done some of the research uh, documenting that uh, fairly strict uh, protection of natural landscapes uh, does not undermine local economic vitality. So that's going at it in a negative way, <laughs> saying that whatever, whatever it does, you know, protecting these areas because we're pursuing these other cultural or ethical uh, 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 issues, uh, whatever it does, uh, it doesn't damage uh, local economic vitality, so that should come off the table. That, I think, is a safe way of dealing with things. But I also have tried to use that discussion to get people to become more self-conscious about why they inhabit particular areas. One of the things when I was talking about studying people's behavior uh, to learn something about how they value wildlands or environmental quality, uh, I could have used the example of why anybody lives in Montana. Uh, the average wage per job, and that's a lousy indicator, but everybody uses it, average wage per job uh, is always near the lowest. Uh, Mississippi sometimes beats us out for that uh, 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 yeah, right. title. <laughs> right. Uh, uh, and the University of Montana it used to be, I suspect it still is, among the lowest paid PhD granting research institution in the United States. Yet, I'm of course not being modest, but I think we still are able to attract, uh, partly because we're tricky, we pay the market price to hire people, but then we never raise their pay again in their lives. Uh, we don't tell them that. Uh, 
in real terms, the highest paid day in my life at the University of Montana was the first day I was hired if you took inflation into account. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but in any case, I mean, we are all stupid. I know where the interstate goes. You know, it takes me to uh, Spokane. I could get, my pay would go up 25%, or anybody's pay would go up 25%. Go on to Seattle. It will go up 50%. Go to Los Angeles. It will go up 100%. The highway is not full of us leaving. Uh, uh, in fact, there's uh, uh, quite a few of the newcomers are returned, people returning. Anyways, my point is that, that we make a sacrifice to live here. We make an economic decision to live here, despite the sacrifice we have to make in terms of pay. Uh, but we don't think we're stupid. We think there's something here uh, that justifies that decision. Uh, and so in these discussions about wilderness or protecting uh, the quality of natural environments, I just try to get people to give some thought to why they continue to live in Hamilton uh, or Darby uh, or in the Flathead Valley or uh, in the Mission Valley, uh, get them to be aware of the choice they've made. It was a smart choice. It wasn't a dumb choice. Uh, so it par I try to use that discussion not to undermine people's valuation of wilderness and the natural environments we have here in Montana, but to get them to be more self-conscious of what it is that brought them here or held them here. Uh, and I think that, I think that helps uh, 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 to just bring that to the, the fore, to get away from the, the constant suggestion that the Montana, as long as I've been here, people have been preaching that the Montana economy is in collapse. We're going to hear it this next go round for the governor's race. The economies, we're always told that the economy is in collapse. Well, of course, it's not in collapse. We're, we're still here. Uh, and there's a good reason why we're still here. And I, we just got, got to get people to understand that besides their paycheck, there's something else they're getting that compensates them enough. Uh, and that's some of the things you've been trying to protect about the place. Oh, we got three minutes. A professor can't say anything in three minutes. I, I have a question. Okay. Um, so you gave some examples or, um, about the ways in which economics, in, in, in some of its ways that it shouldn't be used. And I was just wondering if you could speak to any specific examples in your kind of current watch on media sources of of hard examples of where economics has been used inappropriately or incorrectly, in your opinion? Well, I think most of the, uh, the discussion of uh, uh, EPA's Clean Power Plan uh, <clears throat> uh, has, has been presented in uh, a historic, hysterical way, and I've actually written about it in that and gotten all sorts of people upset at me. Uh, but I, I, given that our legislators, legislators were going over and our previous governor had gone over to the state of Washington to chew out uh, the state of Washington for not building coal ports and for uh, shutting down coal-fired plants. And now the greatest sin of all is that uh, Oregon and Washington are on the verge of legislating uh, that the utilities serving them can't buy power from coal-fired generators. Uh, and, and so since our legislators have gone over there to tell them how, what catastrophe this will be for Montana, uh, I figured I should go over and and give a, provide a different different view uh, of of the whole th of the whole thing. I mean, uh, so that I think that 
that that economic impact approach is just cultivated to generate scare stories. Uh, any way you cut it, uh, if all of Coal Strip were to shut down, the, the, the Montana economy would not stumble and fall on its face. We are, even though we're one of the largest coal producing states in the United States, we aren't a coal state. Uh, uh, the, the number of people directly uh, involved in the mining uh, is somewhat uh, over a thousand. The, the people involved in the employed directly in the coal strip facilities is, you know, something like 600 people. Uh, uh, we we have 600,000 jobs in Montana, uh, and acting as if. The loss of a thousand, thousand jobs sounds like horrendous, horrendous. But the idea that that would cause some serious stumble like the Great Recession, uh, uh, it's just not true. And the people doing the modeling and coming up with the big numbers that we're going to lose 7,000 jobs uh, or that uh, the billions of dollars will be lost, uh, what they show, if you just look at their numbers, is that the growth of the Montana economy, rather than stumbling and turning down as in the Great Recession, the, the Montana economy, and this is the people who are generating the big numbers, the Montana economy will continue to grow at an ever so slightly slower rate of growth. There's not going to be a decline in the Montana economy. There's going to be an ever so slightly decline in the rate of the growth of the Montana economy. So. Uh, you have a cottage industry that churns out economic exaggerations uh, that uh, is just not helpful in trying to get people to sit down and reason together or talk about mitigation measures. That's what we should be talking about. Coal Strip and Rosebud County are going to get hammered. Bighorn County are going to get hammered. We should be talking about what we're going to do. Uh, this is a coal town. It's a company town. It's a one industry town. Uh, they've gone through when the railroads turned from coal to diesel, the economy in Coal Strip collapsed. Uh, when, at, once the Coal Strip, one, two, three, and four, were, uh, the construction was done uh, and they're just operating, the population went from 8,000 to 4,000. And 10 years later, all of the plants operating full bore. Uh, the population was down to about 2,100. Uh, so this is the third or fourth cycle that this company town has gone through. And I, I'm not minimizing that. Uh, but we should be focused on what can we do, not for the state economy, but for the people who are going to get hammered. We should all be focused on that. That's where the hurt's going to be. It's not going to be here in Missoula because we have fewer tra coal trains going through. Uh, most of us will cheer. Uh, 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 we'll cruise on through, but the people back in Rosebud, but in Bighorn County, uh, are going to have some very serious uh, adjustments to make. See, couldn't do it in three minutes. I quit. <laughs>